Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to our Ash Wednesday service. We'll read responsively from the bulletin. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, Christ have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. O God, the Father in heaven, have mercy on us. O God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. O God, the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. King of glory and Lord of might, deliver us from evil. King of glory and Lord of might, save us in temptation and trial. King of glory, you were enthroned in a manger at your birth. You were condemned through your life, though your life was holy and good. You were brought low by rejection. You were marked with suffering and pain. You were judged by those you came to save. You were crowned with thorns and robed in mockery. You were wounded and bore in your flesh the anguish of us all. You were raised up and enthroned upon the cross. You were despised by men and forsaken by God. You were swallowed up in death and laid in a grave. For us and for our salvation. That we who were dead in sin might be made alive forevermore. That we who sacrificed our glory to death might be raised to immortality that we who caused your suffering might be set free from suffering, that we who were made unclean by evil might be made holy and declared just, that we who raised you up on the cross might learn to walk in its way, that we who lost our joy might be led to rejoice in hope again, that we who live in fear might be granted courage to live by faith. We ask you to hear us, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. For your willingness to be born among us, as one of us, yet without sin. We give you thanks, O Lord. For your choice to suffer in our place and die in our stead. We give you for your sacrifice that gives us forgiveness, life, and salvation. We, we give you thanks, O Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you despise nothing. You have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and contrite hearts that lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, we may receive from you full pardon and forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed, by my fault, by my own fault, by my mo own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, Forgive me all my sins and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. Amen. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and 
and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed, by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all of my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. is found in Joel 2, verses 12 through 19. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings, and drink offerings for the Lord your God. 
Blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. Bring together the elders. Gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who have ministered before Lord weep between the temple porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord will be jealous for his land and take pity on his people. The Lord will reply to them, I am sending you grain, new wine and oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Today's psalm, Psalm 51, will be read responsibly. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Behold, I brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. The second lesson is found in 2 Corinthians, 5th chapter, verses 20 through 6.10. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, 
we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing poor, yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, and 19 through 21. Jesus said, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in a may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Do we have any kids here today? A couple? Okay. Can I get a couple kids come forward? <clears throat> Clara and Perry. Hey, girls. Wow, look at this. I'm getting nice crowd. Sweet. Hey, Brianna. Cheyenne. Okay, so have a seat. So, there's a TV show on where, um, where a bunch of people sit up front in chairs and they, um, and they listen to people sing and, uh, and they judge them. You know what show I'm talking about, right? Well, I was thinking, American Idol is one of them, you're right, but I was thinking of The Voice, right? Because they sit in those big red chairs, right? And then those chairs spin around. And it's kind of neat seeing those chairs because if you're in one of those chairs, what does that mean? You're really good, right? You, you, you've been a success in singing or, or you're, you're somehow like being held up and you're, you're honored, right? Because you get to sit in one of those chairs. So now, here's this chair, okay? And this isn't just like a regular chair. I want you guys to think about that this is a chair that when you sit in it, you have all kinds of power. People will listen to you, do whatever you say, and they will bring you gifts and money and food and anything you want. But sitting in that chair is also a big responsibility because it means you are responsible for everyone else who comes to you. Someone comes with a problem, you have to help them fix it. Someone comes with, you know, uh, a situation where they've been, they've been hurt, you have to help solve the problem. So who wants to sit in that chair? Really? And you're prepared, ladies, to 
to take the responsibility of sitting in that chair? Well, I wouldn't, don't judge whether Clara's prepared or not, because you don't know. We can't judge each other. The point is that sitting in a, in a chair of authority is great from one perspective, right? Because you get to sit here and everybody bows down and says, oh, you're great. Oh, but you've got to be really responsible too. And I know for me, I would be really scared to sit in that chair. Now today, we're going to be listening a little bit about Solomon and his throne. And what I wanted you guys to think about is the ultimate throne, right? The most righteous throne. Who sits on the most righteous throne? Louder? Yeah. Jesus, that's right. He's sitting at the throne of God. And, and the Bible says he sits at the right hand of God. He's, he's part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's the judge. He's the, the person who looks out for us. He talks to God the Father on our behalf. He sends us the Holy Spirit, so we have a, his presence here on earth. And someday, many, 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 many years from now, when we're in heaven, we'll get to see that throne. And you'll know right then and there that he's the only one who really belongs on that throne because he can take care of all of our problems, he can solve all of our issues, he can provide for all of our needs. And he never makes a mistake or a bad judgment. Not like the people on The Voice, you know, sometimes they pick somebody who really can't sing. So, I'm gonna let you go back to your seats, your little thrones, they're not, they're not big thrones, they're just the pews where the regular people sit. And we'll talk about Solomon, and we'll talk about his throne, and we'll talk a little more about, about Jesus. You guys know what today is, right? Ash Wednesday. And it's the beginning of Lent. Bless you, yes, the beginning of Lent. This is a time that you want to start thinking about, thinking about yourself and thinking about your relationship with God and where you are. Are you close to God? Could you be closer? You know, are there ways you could serve him by helping others? Is there more praying you could do? Could you read the Bible more? These are all little things that we should ask ourselves as we lead up to Good Friday and to Easter, okay? All right, well, thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to pray, and then I'll let you guys go back, all right? Lord, I thank you so much for these young ladies and young men, and I just ask that you continue to bless them in their bodies, in their minds, in their spirits, Lord, that you would grow all three so that they may become the young men and young women that you created them to be, that you would protect them and surround them in all manner and all walks as they go through life. And we just ask that you would draw them closer to you, Lord, that they might learn that you, as their Savior alone, can provide for their needs, their wants, their concerns, and can bear all of their burdens. In Jesus we pray, amen. Okay, beat it. Ash Wednesday kind of feels, you know, when I see the black paraments on, on the altar, I, I, I get more of a sense of, like, Good Friday, you know, and the, thanks, Tom. I get more of a sense of the somberness of, of Good Friday, and, and, uh, and the, whole, the whole point of, 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 Ash, of Ash Wednesday and the Lenten season is really to kind of take us to, take us to the mountainside. Take us to the, the point of, of Christ's passion and allow us to reflect on our own sinfulness um, and prepare as we go through this Lenten season to find that, that unity with Christ in, in what he's done for us uh, on the cross. It's not something we just want to run right up to. I think it's, I think it's appropriate that it's this 40-day journey that takes us through time. We, we think of Jesus as, you know, being tempted in the desert for 40 days and being challenged with all manner of, of opportunities that he chose not to accept um, 
which would have been beneficial to him individually, but not to us as a whole. And so we need to kind of take that same, that same journey. So um, while everyone is, is really kind of quiet tonight and uh, seems somewhat somber, I think it's, 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 it's appropriate. Um, other than the fact that it's, it's an evening service and we're just not used to that as opposed to Sundays. So, you know, tonight's sermon is called The King's Wisdom, and I'm just going to kind of move a little in and around it. Um, it's not quite the sermon that I had intended to, to use tonight, but that's the way the Lord works. So, um, you know, Solomon is, is known as um, somebody who was, like, really super smart. Um, he became king very young, and he prayed to God and said, Lord, you know, I just don't have any of the capacity to lead this kingdom that my father left me, and I just don't know what to pray for. I don't know how to lead these people, so I'm going to pray for wisdom. And the Lord heard that prayer and said, Solomon, you know, you could have asked for anything. You could ask for money. You could ask for, for, you know, long life. Um, but you didn't. You asked for wisdom. And, and because you asked for the right thing, he said, I'm going to give you wisdom, and I'm going to give you that other stuff too. So we read in the Bible that Solomon was, you know, phenomenally wealthy and, and had all kinds of things at his disposal in, in his massive kingdom. But wisdom was his trademark. And his ability to make, uh, you know, very appropriate and even profound decisions uh, is something that other, other kings and other leaders came to just, just sit around and listen to him. And we, we think about that, but when you read through First and Second Samuel and you, and you get to the end of Solomon's life, you realize that he didn't end really well. Um, Solomon got really off on a, on a divergent path, and he allowed his surroundings to, to cause him to go into directions that he should have never gone in. And we, we can benefit from reading some of his, his stuff in Psalms. And we read about, you know, or in, in Ecclesiastes where he, you know, he, he did this and that and the other thing. And he found that nothing brought him happiness. You know, he, he drank to his heart's content. Didn't, didn't work. You know, he planted gardens and built buildings and had concubines and had all kinds of, of, of pleasures in a worldly sense available to him. Nothing made him happy. And so... We see in ourselves, when we reflect on, on the wisdom and the opportunities that are available for us, the possibility, like Solomon, to kind of go off in a different direction and find ourselves further and further from God. And, and that's really where, where Solomon's life kind of got, got chaotic. He started off by being a king and having everything at his disposal, and he, he ended up not leaning on his his wisdom, and going, going way afar. So in this, in this Ash Wednesday, as we, we think about ourselves, we, we need to think about our own hypocrisy. You know, I, I hate to sound derogatory, but the reality is when I'm teaching the youth or I'm working with my own family, I have to be realistic about who I am as a human being and knowing that I'm imperfect. So for me, it's real easy to come to the cross on Ash Wednesday and come to the cross for on Good Friday and acknowledge that I need Jesus' forgiveness and salvation because I am imperfect. I may be the least perfect person in this room. But I do try and make every effort I can to do the things that I think God would want me to do. The, the gospel verse talked about don't, don't do things in a way that everybody can see. Don't, uh, you know, walk up to somebody and say, hey, Mr. Poor Man, here's a dollar. Look, everyone, I'm giving him a dollar. You know, we're, we're not supposed to announce the good works that we do. You know, good works don't save you, right? We, we know that. Um, I was raised in the, in the Jewish faith where uh, good deeds, mitzvot, you know, were, were something you were to pursue. You were to try and do good deeds as often as possible in hopes that maybe somehow you could gain enough favor that, uh, that the Lord would look, look kindly on you. But the reality is good deeds don't save you any more than sitting in these pews save you. 
I mean, pagans could do good deeds. Um, so good deeds alone are not enough, but it, it's faith combined with those good deeds that help you to get closer to God. And yet we're not supposed to promote those. We're not supposed to do them actively and openly. And that was one of the challenges that, that Solomon faced. In his, in his desire to build the, the temple for the Lord, he was building this symbol of grandeur on which he hoped to, to be remembered and he hoped to gain favor with the Lord. Uh, and the Bible is very explicit about everything that he put into it. You know, his, you know I, I referred to a, a throne with the kids, but his, his throne was, was ivory and it was covered in gold and it had these lions and, and serpents and I mean, it was just magnificent. Yet, with, without you know, equal, you could sit on that throne uh, and have the power that Solomon had. But if you don't have the wisdom to be able to, to truly know how to connect with God, it's, it's just an ornament. And, and that was Solomon's downfall, was that he was relying on all of these things in his life to bring him closer to God whatever, without ever really looking at himself honestly and realizing that he wasn't close to God. And in fact, he was, he was being rather hypocritical in, in his life. Um, many, many wives, many, many children. It's completely contrary to what the Lord had wanted for him. But again, because he was filled with power and believed that he could do all things without, without recourse or without being punished, Solomon went his own way. When we, think of, when we think of a king, when I think of a king, in a worldly sense, there's not many examples to, to compare. We have the, the royals in, in the UK. We have, a, I guess, a king in Morocco or Monaco or wherever, wherever that place is. Uh, you know, here in the US, we have some very celebrated families that have historically been very prominent, and we, we think of them almost maybe as royal to an extent in, in, our, in our world. But I, I, don't, I don't easily relate to them. Um, for me, Jesus sitting on that throne that I referred to with the kids is, is a much more relatable king. Um, I, see, I see him in the Bible as someone like myself, someone who rose from somewhat humble means, who walked among common people, who did the very same things that, that you and I do. He ate and drank and worked and, and loved and cried and shared, and yet still had the opportunity to, to reflect on the wisdom that he had in a way that, that impacted everybody in a very positive way. Unlike all of the human examples that we see in the Bible where God bestows power and, and opportunity and invariably somebody goofs up and, and God ends up having to forgive him and, and call him back to him, Jesus was able to manage all of the opportunity that he had to focus on himself and turn it back toward others. So to me, that's, that's a... That's a king I can relate to, somebody who is very much like me, uh, someone who can understand what I'm going through. And whether it's, you know, whether it's dirty feet or, or an achy back um, or just a stressful situation in, in his town, Jesus could relate to the people who, who he was ministering to. And, and that, I think, is an ultimate sign of wisdom. If you can... If you can relate to the people whom you are around, I think that's a king who, who the people will follow. And so they did. They followed Jesus, just like Solomon was followed by his, by his followers. But let's look, at the, let's look at the contrast. I think it's interesting that Solomon is listed in the Bible as one of the wealthiest men who ever lived. Had a massive kingdom. All of these, these things are described in the Bible, and yet there's not a, a single 
archaeological piece of evidence that Solomon existed. Now, of course, I believe he existed. The Bible says he does. And, and, I'm, and I believe that's 100% true. But in all of these years of archaeological finds and, and things that have proven so much in the Bible, and, and again, it's something that you as believers should, very, should stand very firmly and confidently on, that of all the faiths, of all the world belief systems, the Bible can be tracked. There is a place called Israel. There is a place called Egypt. There are these places that are listed in the Bible that are real, and yet there's no evidence of Solomon. There's nothing for everything that he built, for all the wealth that he had, for all the, 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 the concubines and the women and the, and, the, and the children, thousands and thousands of children that would have come from him. Nobody can stand up today and say, oh, I'm Solomon's, you know, great times 16 grandson. And contrast that to Jesus. Beloved and followed, owned nothing. Uh, save perhaps the clothing that he wore. Um, didn't have a place to live. Um, put up no big building signs or wonders that, that would be listed in the Bible as, as you know, the greatest, you know, one of the greatest wonders of the earth. Um, and yet his, his power, his presence remains today. His influence is greater today than, than ever before. Why? Because the wisdom that Jesus brought to this earth was in fact a king's wisdom. It was the wisdom endowed by God through the power of the Holy Spirit. It is a wisdom that can only be given to someone who is in fact God himself. It, it's, it's a wisdom that sees your heart and my heart and knows what it is we struggle with. And that's a king I can relate to. I can relate to someone who is bigger than me and yet knows me. I'm not sure if I saw Prince Charles out on the road, if I could just walk up to him and say, hey, Charles, what's happening? You know, give him a high five and, and feel like we could have a chat. But I think if... If Jesus were physically here today, I feel like I could have a conversation with him. And I could relate to him, you know, some of my trials and tribulations of the day. And he would understand. And ultimately, that's, that's where we need to take Ash Wednesday and our Lenten season and our personal reflection as we go to the mountainside throughout this season and we walk with Jesus to Golgotha for the crucifixion. We have to reflect on our, in our own lives. Are we reflecting wisdom and kindness and love and mercy? If we were sitting on that seat, if we were the one responsible to meet the needs of others, to help fix problems, share concerns, are we, are we prepared for that? Could we do that? what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be loving each other, sharing our burdens, caring for each other, helping someone. Even though we may have limited resources on our own, Jesus says, if somebody wants your coat, give them your cloak. If they want, you know, a dollar, give them two. If they want to walk a mile, walk two. So these are things we're supposed to be doing anyway. That's that's the wisdom of God endowed in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a king's wisdom. And yet we're not kings. We're not, we're not royal. But Jesus is in our lives as if we are. And that's something that, that I want to leave you with now is as you reflect on your, your sinfulness, as I will reflect on mine, and you have, if you're me, you have a tendency to maybe beat yourself up a little more than, than somebody else would. Take that moment when you're done and remember that not only have you been given the king's wisdom, but you are the king's child. 
And as a king's child, you are, you are royal. You are destined for greatness. You have the full eternity of life to look forward to and to inherit. And that's greater than, than any earthly inheritance. That's greater than any, any purse or prize or endowment that we could ever expect or, or hope to have here on this earth like Solomon did in, in the form of coin or, or gold or, or palaces. The unseen reality of, of what the Lord has bestowed in us in, in wisdom and, and power and knowledge and love is the greatest possession it is the greatest gift, and it's the greatest solace that we have to rebound us from the, the depths of thinking that we're, we're stinkers. We're all sinners, but we're sinners saved by grace. So I just encourage you now as, as we go forward with the rest of our service and, um, and go through the Lenten season, reflect appropriately on where you are today, but where you will be tomorrow in Christ. And know that that is a progression, not just up to the mountainside, but back down again to the world, where you'll then serve and love and share with those around you, and you'll be doing exactly what Jesus asked you to do and exactly what we're going to see him do throughout the Lenten season. Thank you very much. Amen. We'll uh, continue now with the gathering of our offerings. Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay. You've set my feet upon the rock, and now I know. friend I will worship you until the very end Jesus lover of my soul Jesus I will never let you go you've taken me from the miry clay You've set my feet upon the rock, and now I know I love you, I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. My Savior, my closest friend, I will worship you until the very end. Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. ask you to please rise for prayers.
Let's recite together the prayer that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, through the work of Jesus, you have established your kingdom and called us into that kingdom by baptism and faith. Continue in us the work of our King, Jesus, that we may be kept safe from harm, faithful amid temptation, patient under trial, hopeful in despair, and made wise unto salvation. Grant us your Holy Spirit to bring us to repentance, and what we believe in our hearts and confess with our lips, we may show forth in our lives, now in this mortal life and forever in eternity, through Jesus Christ, our King, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Lord preserve your coming and going. From this time forth and even forevermore. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord bring you to everlasting life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is The Wonderful Cross. When I survey the
Oh, 